Riot Games is a company widely known for making one of the most popular games on the planet, League of Legends. Whether you're a fan of the MOBA, a multiplayer online battle arena game, or not, you still might be aware of some of the more popular characters and lore about the game. After all, it is one of the most popular esports around. What you might not know, however, is that the same lore is the basis for a popular online card game, Legends of Runeterra. Legends of Runeterra is a free-to-play digital collectible card game, released in April of this year. It's the new kid on the block when it comes to digital card games, and so it has stiff competition from the likes of Hearthstone, Pokemon TCG Online, and even Magic Arena. Legends of Runeterra is free-to-play, and unlike most free-to-play games, it has been hailed as one of the least predatory economic models around. What's more, the game is incredibly fun, probably, honestly, one of the best new games I've personally experienced in years, and this video will teach you everything you need to know, from deck construction to gameplay and rules, in a matter of minutes. The first thing to do is head over to download the client. Once you've registered or logged into your Riot Games account, you can get it started right away. You'll be plunged straight into the prologue, a tutorial, and here the basics of the game are explained. Make sure you set aside a good 20 to 30 minutes for the first time you log in. Legends of Runeterra is a 1v1 card game, and the goal is simple. Each player must reduce the opponent's nexus from 20 to 0. To do that, players each bring a deck filled with allies and spells, and command their ally units to strike against their opponent's nexus. If you've played Magic the Gathering, you'll have a bit of a head start here, as the fundamental gameplay does share some similarities. The main mode of Legends of Runeterra is Constructed, and that's the mode you'll play the most. It's the default mode, and the mode that you'll play when you choose to use the Play vs. Player or Play vs. AI options. In the constructed mode of Legends of Runeterra, you can build a deck of up to 40 cards. Each deck can use cards from a maximum of up to two regions, and is limited to six champions per deck. Three copies maximum per champion. If you've ever played other card games before, you'll notice this isn't dissimilar to how other games work when it comes to building decks. There are six different base factions in the game, each one with various play styles, strengths, and weaknesses. These factions aren't as firm as, say, the Color Pie and Magic the Gathering, but they do provide some basic structure and theme to the cards available. Abilities do bleed over, and so too do deck styles, but that's not to say they aren't distinctly different enough to feel unique in their own right. In short, the regions are... Noxus, an aggressive faction that punishes injured units and often cares about swarming units and damage to the opposing nexus. Demacia, a faction that cares a lot about big efficient creatures, choosing where our opponents block and combat tricks. Definitely the most mid-range faction. Ionia, the factions of ninjas and tricks expect a lot of bouncing creatures back to hand and stunning creatures to stop them joining combat. This faction also favors unblockable creatures, too. Piltover and Zaun. This is the faction of mad scientists and experiments, and as such, loves slinging spells and embracing random chants. Shadow Isles, the spooky faction, with lots of ways to profit from our own allies falling in battle, as well as hard removal and board wipe effects. Freyord, fight the cold with unity and big creatures. Lots of ways to synergize and ramp up to game-ending allies. More factions are added with new updates and expansions. Thankfully, when you start a new account on Legends of Runeterra, you'll be granted a number of starter decks that you can practice and play with right away. These decks have some powerful cards in them from the get-go, and are more than adequate to learn the basics of the game. So, no need to worry about building a deck from scratch right now. Let's just learn how to play. Decks are made up of cards in two main categories that then fall into further subcategories. The main two categories are Ally and Spell. Allies are creatures, heroes, and monsters, and, when played, exist continually in play until they are defeated. Spells are one-shot effects that can be used for a buff or as a way of disrupting an opponent. Once they're used, they're gone. Let's look at the anatomy of a common card. For this video, we'll be looking at the Buff and Tough intro deck. Cythria of Cloudfield is a basic ally card. Non-champion allies are known as followers. Her cost is in the top left corner, one mana. She can be played as early as round one. Next, she has an orange attack number and a red health number. The attack number is how much damage Cythria will deal to the enemy nexus or any blocking creature when she strikes. 
The red health number shows how much damage our ally can take before it dies. In Cythria's case, it's two. Unlike in other games, such as Magic the Gathering, damage isn't removed at the end of turn. Instead, it persists and will weaken our ally's defense as the game progresses. Allies can be as simple as Cythria or much more complex with more abilities. Kindly Tavern Keeper costs three mana for a 3-3, and when we play him, we get the effect of healing either our Nexus or an ally for up to three points. Cards will generally be stronger and more threatening the higher they cost in mana. The other subtype of ally card is the Champion. Champion cards will be very familiar to anyone who plays League of Legends, as these are the characters from the game in card form. You'll be able to add up to six of your favorite champions to a deck. Whether as three copies of two different champions, which follows the deck building rule of three maximum copies of any one card, or by taking six different champions. In the buff and tough intro deck, there are four champions, one copy each of Braum, Garen, Lux, and Trindamir. Champions are very powerful allies, and as well as limiting how many you can run, the game will display the champions of each deck to the players before the game begins, so that each player can strategize and plan around these powerful game pieces. Champions also have an additional ability outside of the strong abilities they have as part of their card. They can level up. Essentially, all champions will have a condition that, when met, will flip them into a stronger version of themselves. These conditions vary, and you do have to jump through a number of hoops in order to pull it off. The reward, though, is worth it. Lux is one of the heroes of the Demacia faction. At six mana, you'll not be able to play her before round six. She has four attack power and five health. She also has some other abilities, like Barrier, which protects her from one source of damage the turn she comes into play and lasts until the end of the round. Nice! Legends of Runeterra has a great way to investigate what a card can do. By right-clicking at any time on a card, you'll zoom in and be able to investigate what the card offers. Hovering over any yellow text abilities will bring up a pop-up window to tell us what the ability does. And if the card creates any other cards or allies, you can shuffle through and look to see what the other cards do. In Lux's case, when she sees you cast six plus mana of spells, she'll level up. She also creates a final spark spell in hand. If we click on a blue text spell while we're zoomed in, we are taken straight to the spell to investigate what the spell does. It's a really easy to use and straightforward way to learn about the cards, and you'll find yourself using this tool a lot as you learn to play. One last caveat with champions. We can't have more than one of the same champion in play. If we do draw a second copy, while we have our champion in play, it becomes the champion spell that's viewable when you investigate the champion. In Lux's case, she would convert additional copies to Lux's Prismatic Barrier. If the Lux in play leaves play, the spell converts back into a copy of Lux. If we cast that spell while we have Lux in play, we don't lose the champion in our hand. Instead, the spell will shuffle a copy of Lux into our deck. It's an elegant way to ensure we don't end up with too many cards we can't cast in our hand. Once you level up your champion, any additional copies of the champion in your deck also level up. So any other Lux we draw into will be the flipped version, if it's not converted into Lux's Prismatic Barrier. For now, we're not going to delve too deeply into each of the mechanics on the cards. Suffice it to say, champions are powerful, and when in doubt, reading the card explains the card. Spells are one-time effects, and so don't have a power and health statistic. Let's look at Radiant Strike. Radiant Strike costs one mana to play and gives an ally plus one plus one this round. It has the burst ability. This means it can be played at any time, including when attacking or blocking, and it also means it will resolve before an enemy has a chance to respond. The other two subcategories of spells are fast and slow. Fast spells can be played at any time, but do give the enemy a chance to respond. And slow spells can only be cast outside of combat at the same speed as playing an ally. They can be responded to and can't be cast to respond to a fast spell or another slow spell. It's a nice and easy to understand system and is comparable to the idea of instants and sorceries in Magic the Gathering. Spells like allies get more complex and more powerful. We've already seen one other spell when we investigated our champion Lux. When she sees us cast six or more mana worth of spells, she will add a final spark to our hand. Final spark costs zero to cast, which is a good job really, considering we already cast six or more mana of spells 
spells to add one to our hand. Final Spark deals four damage to an enemy, which is pretty sweet. By hovering over the icons in the text box, we can see that it's a slow spell, and it also has Overwhelm and Fleeting. Overwhelm means any excess of damage will be dealt to the enemy Nexus, and Fleeting means we have to cast the spell this turn or we lose it. Now that we know what the main card types are, let's jump into a game and learn how to play. The player who starts first is decided randomly, and each player is given a starting hand of four cards. At this point, a player may opt to replace any of the cards in hand for another randomly selected from the deck. The goal here is to have a good selection of low to medium cost cards, and a good mana curve. Essentially, you want your spells and allies to gradually increase in cost, and to maximize the likelihood that you have something to do with your mana in the opening turns of a game. If you do want to replace some of the cards, you may click Replace on as many or as few of the cards as you wish before clicking OK to begin the game. The main way in which Legends of Runeterra differentiates itself as a card game is that it isn't played in turns, but rather in rounds. Each round, players alternate between being the aggressor and the defender. Most other card games give each player a turn to play cards and declare attacks, before passing the turn to the other player. In Legends of Runeterra, you may play cards on any round, but you may only attack on alternate rounds. To play a card, you need to have the initiative. The player who is on the role of the aggressor always starts with the initiative, and whenever they take a game action, the initiative is passed to the opponent to take an action. An action is either playing a spell or ally or declaring an attack. One thing to keep in mind is that you may only have six allies in play at any one time, and this goes for any allies created by abilities as well. So if you have eight mana to cast a card like Trindamir and try to close the game, you'll have to sacrifice an another ally in play if you already have six on the board. Generally, you'll opt for a cheap one, or one that's already damaged. To declare an attack, you'll need to be in possession of an attack token. When you're the aggressor, you start the turn with an attack token, and you may declare your attack at any point in the turn, before or after taking other actions. If you're lucky, some spells and abilities can give you attack tokens to use when the opponent is the aggressor, effectively letting you attack two turns in a row. When a player in possession of an attack token wants to take an action to attack, it couldn't be simpler. Just drag and drop your ally units forward into the main play area. Once attackers are declared, the opponent may declare any blockers. Each creature may only be blocked by one other creature. Deciding whether to attack first or play more creatures to attack with is one of the biggest decision points in the game. So if you'd rather go straight to combat before playing spells, you can do so. This is a handy way to stop an opponent gaining the initiative, which will give them the chance to play an ally or a slow spell in reaction to your plans. If your first action is to attack, then you will move to the combat phase, and the opponent will have no opportunity to play allies or slow spells, and can only declare their blockers or play fast spells instead. The trade-off for attacking before playing more allies is that your attack force will be smaller, and your opponent will have access to more mana for casting, fast spells, and other tricks during combat. It's a really interesting tempo-based system, and it ensures that games are always interactive with interesting decision points. Once blockers are assigned, units deal damage to each other, and any units that receive lethal damage are destroyed. Damage otherwise persists for the rest of the game unless a spell or ability can remove it. Attacks are resolved sequentially from left to right. This means that you can set up buffs or other abilities to trigger mid-combat, creating a cascade of value. For example, the champion Darius will level up when the enemy nexus has 10 or less health. If you place him to the right of your field of attackers, there's a chance he can level up mid-combat, giving you a stronger unit as the combat phase progresses. It's one of those aspects that's simple to grasp, but has a lot of depth to it, so keep an eye out for ways to take advantage of it. Mana is the resource you need to cast spells and summon allies. In order to play a card, you must have the mana to spend to cast it. So, how do you get mana? Well, at the start of round one, both players' pools fill with one mana automatically. On every subsequent round, the mana pool of both players increases by one point. 
So on round two, you'll both start with two mana, and on round seven, you'll both start with seven. This is a really cool system and means you're never stuck drawing into cards that can't be cast. Unlike in Magic, your decks don't need lands for mana, and unlike in Pokemon, you don't need energy cards either. It's a great way to ensure players don't suffer too much variance while still providing limitations to what can be achieved in a turn. The idea of a mana curve, the order you cast spells increasing in cost, is something we covered earlier. It's really important important in Legends of Runeterra to be able to play to this curve, as it's the main limitation to casting your spells. A handful of 8-mana spells is not something you want to keep. Use that replace function to hopefully get some cheaper options for early game. There's one more great gameplay feature I'd like to cover to get you set up, and that's spell mana. Spell mana is a way to bank any unspent mana to save for future rounds. At the end of a round, up to three unspent mana are put into spell mana storage. You may keep this mana stored for as long as you like, and it doesn't empty between rounds. There's one caveat, it may only be spent on spells and not allies. More than just offering you the chance to maximize the mana you spend, spell mana helps to balance the game. If for whatever reason you don't cast as many spells as the opponent in the first three rounds, you'll end up going into round three with the potential of having six mana available to your opponent's three. This is a great way to help catch up. Now you know how to play, but how do you build your collection? Legends of Runeterra has a fairly unique free-to-play scheme in that there are no traditional booster packs. You cannot buy random cards with real money. You can only buy wild cards, and even then, only a limited number per week. Unlike other competitors in the market, you can't just drop a bunch of cash to own all the cards at once. Instead, you'll have to play and earn rewards for the various progression systems, daily log-in incentives, and weekly rewards. Every day you'll receive new missions worth a decent chunk of experience, and it's not too difficult to fill out your daily and weekly goals. You can play versus the AI or versus friends. You can play ranked, you can play casual. It doesn't matter. Any of these will help grow your collection. It's a great way to support a free-to-play model and means you don't need to be an expert with dozens of hours of experience in order to queue and earn more cards for your collection. There's also an in-game currency in addition to wild cards, shards, which can be used to buy cards. Shards are earned through the various progression systems and also given to you in place of any cards you earn beyond the three copies you need for a deck. You'll get a percentage of the shard price for a card back when you open duplicates. Legends of Runeterra is a really fun digital card game, and though it's easy to pick up, it has a lot of depth and a lot of potential to grow into a game you'll want to come back to again and again. Gameplay is smooth and easy to grasp, and the progression and card building system is pretty fair and achievable. One advantage it has being a digital card game is that the game can use interesting mechanics like adding abilities, buffs, or debuffs to cards within the deck while you're playing the game. It opens up a lot of strategies and design space and makes for interesting deck building considerations. There's also the fact that due to having no paper-based game compatriot, Legends of Runeterra can be patched like any other video game. This means if a certain card turns out to be overpowered, it can be slightly adjusted to make it less oppressive without outright banning the card or strategy. It's definitely an advantage over competitor games like Magic Arena, which hasn't yet diverged from the paper cards available in physical booster packs. Now, I hope very much this guide to playing Legends of Runeterra was helpful to you today. Let me know in the comments below what you think about the game and what game you'd like to see a video like this on next. Remember to like, leave a comment, comment, and subscribe, and if you really like the work that went into this video, hit that bell icon so that you can be notified when the next one goes up.